Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. On the show today, the latest on the mess that is the Marc Marquez Portimao penalty. Could two former teammates be switching bikes mid season? It's crunch time for Morbidelli, and of course, a look forward to this weekend's Spanish Grand Prix. Remember, if you want to send us a question, you can voice note us, do it on your phone, you can email it to podcast at crash.net along with your name and where you're from. Keep it to 30 seconds, and we'll get you on the show. Right, the recording date is Tuesday, the 25th of April. My name is Harry Benjamin. Joining me, as always, is Crash Motor GP editor Pete McLaren and former Grand Prix rider and British champion Keith Hewin. Now, we know this is going to be out of date very quickly, <laughs> but what the hell is going on with Marquez at the moment? Is he going to serve this penalty? What's the deal? I had a good ring round last night before because I knew, obviously, we were recording this today. <clears throat> and, um, you know, they know, obviously. Um, you, you can't, they probably knew three weeks ago, two weeks ago, exactly how this was all going to go at the end of the day. But no, there hasn't been the official um, notification yet from the FIM. We'll get it on Thursday. My guess is from the the padded vibe is that, that there'll, there'll be no further penalty because Honda will win whatever they've appealed against. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because you can't change the rules. You can't just issue a penalty and then modify it because you haven't written it properly. Yeah, not in my view anyway. And I think that's the general view around the paddock. Um Quite interesting that uh, this this week in the, in the papers, if you like the the online papers and so on and so forth, Vier has the uh, FIM president has, has been getting a fair old whacking from various places. You know, uh, my favourite, and I've got I've, I've translated this from German because it was in uh, Speed Week, um, which is another online uh, enterprise with my old mate Gunter Wiesinger. Uh, Jorge Vier has this is about is known for not being able to keep his mouth in check. He therefore puts his foot in it at regular intervals with accuracy. <laughs> That's a fair swipe, I've got to say. But Gunter has been around a long time. And there's a journal that I have quite a lot of respect for. And he does dig up really good stories. And this was in res- respect to Viejas blasting off about how wonderful he's done in, in the paddock. How he's revamped the, the VFIM, the, the, our overarching um, licensing body, if you like. And that he's brought in good people to, to do good work because he figured that in the past they didn't really do much around the paddock. But... I don't think there's too many people that have noticed what they've done so far, apart from appearing camera now and again, but um, quite interesting stuff. And it was regarding uh, Viejas blasting off and saying that he expects Suzuki back in MotoGP um, when yeah, nobody expects that at all with the, the with the things that are going on behind the scenes financially with Suzuki and what they're overcoming regarding um, future projects, should we say. So the fact he said that he expected them back. He did say that Kawasaki and BMW won't be coming back, which I think Probably my dog could have actually said because he knows as much about that job. Um, so there, there have been some quite amusing things, and there's a film out apparently coming out in 2025 as well. That, 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 uh, that you can tell it's been a slow week because they've been scouring the bottom of the barrel <laughs> for all these stories. So a MotoGP film. Um, one of the producers that was involved in the Rush, if you remember, um, the Formula One film that was quite good actually. I quite enjoyed Rush. Um, but uh, one of the producers on that is involved with Warner Brothers, so it's well-funded. It will be well-distributed, so it looks like it might be. But it's a storyline for the youth, apparently. So, uh, Harry, you'll be watching it, yeah. Well, actually, you're not a youth anymore. You're 26. Well, come, oh, come on. Actually, uh, 21 in showbiz years. Um, <laughs> right around the neck. <laughs> it's interesting. Warner Brothers, they, of course, they now own... BT, right, technically? Well, they're part, they're, they're part of the consortium with Liberty that, hmm. the, the, again... Talking of overarching, that's the the big the big bucks behind Discovery, Eurosport, BT Sport, um, you know, rah rah rah. Mm. Uh, they're all, and then then there's all three media, which is forty odd bro- uh, production companies that North One is part of. The North One are the company that produce the MotoGP um, programming. Um, well, yeah, that's another thing. You know, it's it's. I think there's a lot of people in broadcasting. This is going to be a, a wild podcast. I can tell we've we're, already we're gone. moving around quite rapidly. It's been six um, minutes. There's quite a lot of people within the broadcast side of things, at track side, that are that are starting to be quite concerned about where their futures might come. I mean, all the BT Sport contracts I know come up at the end of next year. Um, they did four year deals. Um, everyone last time around. So they. They've, they're on the big money. That's the that's the magic, the the, the the good money. But everybody below that is on considerably less. Um, and you can be sure that if one company owns a lot of them nowadays, they ain't going to the top scale, are they? They're going somewhere in the median. So, mm. um, so there there may be a bit of a. And we've already noticed, you know, Charlie Hiscock's dropped off the edge of the of the, of the earth. You've got 
a different situation regarding the even the BSB. Greg Haynes has stayed out doing World Superbikes. He's not coming back to do any BSB stuff. There's been a bit of a subtle shuffle here and there. Um, and all of that is really lining up to what's going to happen at the end of next year regarding broadcasting. I'll tell you, I did, back in the day when I was a youth, I did some work experience at North One in the development department. I sort of won the well, opportunity to do it from university, developing nothing to do with MotoGP. It was developing like game show ideas. But it was quite fun. Neil, uh, North One is a great company. Neil Duncanson, top man at Neil, you know, Neil Duncanson, is a, an old hack. He's been around forever and produced stuff forever knows the television on the back of his hand knows how to do a deal knows how to get that mm. deal back when he goes bouncing off in another direction plays the game um not to everybody's cup of tea that's for sure but he's like i say he knows what he's at and he is north one is just one of 40 odd companies that are owned by all three media which are now owned by discovery which is part of eurosport part of liberty rah 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 part of warner uh, i mean they've all got a hand in it somewhere um Every, everyone knows and everyone it, and of course, it'll all be TNT. You know, BT yeah, Sport, yeah. Discovery, Eurosport will all be TNT by the end of this year. It'll be rebranded um, under one name. Now, how that works out for the fan at home, getting more to the point, um, how that bundles and how that works. Yeah, MotoGP.com, if they actually ever got their act together um, regarding consistency in their um, quality of stuff, I know quality's wrong because the quality is really good what MotoGP.com produce um, through Dorna. But their delivery is poor. You know, it breaks down, it breaks up. You don't always get what you want. You know, it's it, people are always chasing it one way or another, depending on what country they're watching it in. Um, if they ever got their act together, they could have stolen a march on all of these home broadcasters. I mean, BT Sport, unfortunately, wouldn't, because of the cost, wouldn't be as attractive perhaps as MotoGP.com if MotoGP.com gave us what they really ought to be able to give us, considering they are the producers of the programming. I mean, all of the on-track stuff, all of your onboards, all of your graphics, all of the stuff that you see on BT Sport, on Eurosport, on, on all those places that are covering, depending on what market you're in, what country you're in, um, it's all coming from Dorna. So therefore, they should have the advantage. They should be the one that you get. They should be the go-to broadcaster. You should just go, I'll pay my descript descript description? Subscription. subscription for, um, for Dorna. For the, for, yeah. <laughs> What, pay that that's all i need <laughs> yeah but, but isn't that strange sorry guys but i mean this is someone who's not involved but as you say keith it's, it's almost like they're getting paid twice at the moment isn't it i think same with f1 because you get the money direct from the consumer if you're if you're doing it on mojtv.com and then you also sell the tv rights as well so it's almost like a double double thing isn't it well, if you lose one of those i i guess one income stream i don't know maybe you well it's them. quite it's quite clever in as much as that what dawner allow is uh, broadcasters, home broadcasters, put their own personalities on it, um, and to, to to dress it up how they want to dress it up, and put their own little features in there and bolt them in around the world feed footage. It's pretty standard stuff. I mean, everybody does it. It's, it's done across everything, um, pretty much in sport. Um, I think what I don't quite understand is where Dawn have kind of missed a trick, really, with with the with the, some of the delivery of the, of their their coverage, um, and they're also notorious for not paying. Um, great money to some of their youngsters. I mean, it's a very young team at Dorna now. They've got some really good up-and-coming young talent. But it doesn't match some of the top talent that are put on some of the home broadcasters, some of the uh, you know, national broadcasters. So maybe that's by design. Maybe that's how Dorna see it. Maybe, you know, like you say, they're taking double bubble. They're taking it from, from those that sign on for the, the Dorna feed and for those broadcasters that are making money off of subscriptions elsewhere. I mean, I'm amazed that that I would I will never know because even having worked closely with all of the main broadcasters at some stage or another, you never really get the true figure. Sometimes the the main man will will let you have a proper glance at it. You know, Harry, how you do the you know who's been watching our crash uh, podcast, who's been watching this podcast. Some people keep it quite quiet. I did some stuff for BBC Sounds uh, last year, and we never really got to know how many listeners, viewers we had on any of that because somehow they keep it to themselves. I don't quite know how some are public out there and you can find the figures, others you can't. I suppose it's discretionary for the for the broadcaster whether they actually put it out or not. Mm, yeah. I think they should. I think it should be out there. You should be able to find out you know, how many people are looking at it uh, because then you can work out what value it has. You know, what value does it have from a, from a fan point of view and also what changes you can make to make it more valuable. I mean... I'd, be, I'd throw this out to crash uh, viewers and listeners. You know, you know what, what do you value? 
what, what do you want? Yeah, let's let's go for it. Let's 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 hear the 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 bits and pieces that you really want. Is it our opinions? Is it purely fact based? Um, you, you pretty much get both on the Crash uh, <laughs> Motor GP podcast. <laughs> You certainly get my opinion, whether you want it or not, but that's another thing. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, we, we, we know we can talk about this a lot, but it is always interesting to hear people's opinions. And of course, we have a global audience, so you know, different TV um, broadcasts around the world do it completely differently. So it's always fascinating to hear uh, what those um, not in the UK, where we are, um, experience their coverage. Let's get back to some more on-track action, shall we? Uh, we've got some stuff coming up this weekend, Pete, but it has been a a little bit of a slow news week, but there has been some talk and rumours and rumblings around Honda, um, who obviously, off the back of an LCR win for uh, Rins, should they be swapping Rins and Mir? Because Mir has had a bit of a disaster start, really. Failed to finish three out of the first six races so far, and, and it's it's Rins that is setting the world alight right now. I think you've got to be careful what you wish for here, because you've got to look at... Uh, Let's take Frankie Morbidelli, runner-up in the World Championship on a satellite Yamaha, goes to the factory team, and okay, he's had the race in Argentina, but other than that, he's been nowhere near the, the form that he had. Okay, the bike has changed, there's other reasons. But the point is, and I think Keith has spoken about this in the past, you've got to have all these little pieces that fit into place to make a rider before the bike, the team. It's not always the latest thing. And so if Rins has got something that's working for him at LCR, in that team, and Keith said family team, maybe that's it. You know, that, I'm sure that's one reason. He's got that in that team. Do you just then give that up to go to the factory team where you might he might find himself in the same position as Mia, who maybe is taking longer to get comfortable? So I think if you if you're performing, and remember Rins is on a factory contract, so yes, in theory that makes it easier to move, but it also means he is supported by the factory directly. He's not a second tier in that sense of oh well, you know, you're not in a you're not contracted to us. You're contracted to the team. He is contracted to HRC directly. He's on the 23 bike. It's not the latest, absolute latest spec, but as he showed, you know, he's he's got the parts he needs to perform well. So, yeah, I, I, I'm just, I think it's a it's a bit early to be saying that kind of thing. I mean, both of them were very evenly matched at Suzuki as well. We know that as well, don't we? You know, they had years together at Suzuki when basically, okay, Mir won the championship, but Rins won more races, etc. So I think, yeah, you know, after three races, I, I think it would be a bit of a rash move, to be honest. And I think, for your question as well, if you're in, you just go, you know what, this is great. I've got a situation where I'm competitive. And and I mean, when he first went to that bike and the first laps on it, people were worried. You know, he's at the back of the field at the Valencia test, wasn't he, in November on that the first ride. Now he's at the front of the field. Okay, let's see if he can continue that form. But when you've got that form, you just try and keep it and run with it, I think. I, I wouldn't want to change anything if I was him. One swift Omega summer, does it? I mean, Kota, we know Rins goes really well at Kota anyway. We know the Honda has great form around, uh, around Kota. So, you know, Circuit of the Americas may be just a bit of a one-off. And you're right, Pete. The fact is, pastoral care. Lucio Cittadino is a great rider to, to drive a rider boss to uh, work with. And at the end of the day, it seems like there's so much tension and so much pressure in the Repsol version, the factory team. And again, you bang on dead right. I've said it times and times and times. I, I remember the first factory bike I got, it was a nightmare. The trouble is with factory bikes, they are so cutting edge that they you're you're in you're in areas that you've not been in before. You know, in this case, electronically and every other way that, that things are so different. Um, having a bike that yeah, we've seen it. When look at Alex Marquez, steps on that Ducati, straight away it works for him. You know, it's a it's a situation where if you're where you are under default, the the you know baseline setting that you've got, like Rins is worked towards, and you're likely to get a bit more flexibility from LCR. You know, Lucio will allow things that, that maybe the main factory Honda team won't allow you to, to experiment with as a factory because Honda have always been quite rigid in there, which is why, you know, reading about, you know, different frames, different swinging arms and all the rest of it that Honda are looking at perhaps trying. We know they've tried the swing arm, whether they'll try the the uh, the, the, the frame uh, as a, a swap out. I don't know just yet, but we'll see whether they do. And that is very, very rare. And again, the question has been asked, is that desperation or is that uh, um, good progress from, from a Honda point of view? We'll what, have to see. On that, can I play you this question from Dean? Have a listen to this. Hi, guys. It's Dean from Essex. Hope you're all well. On a first note, I think we should see much more of Keith Ewan's old racing days on videos because that was awesome. It's good to look yeah. back over these days and it was awesome watching that. It really was. Uh, on a second note, what do you think about the rumours that 
Mark Marquez or HRC took the development chassis off of Alex Rins um, that he was testing and he's going to be testing the old chassis or using the old chassis going forwards to Jerez or Jerez, sorry. <laughs> um, let me know your thoughts on that uh, and wish you well, guys. Have a good day. Cheers, Dean. That's a, that actually is a good point Dean brings up there. The fact is that because LCR are under factory contract, rather than swapping riders about, it's more likely they'll swap bits about. Mm. Um, you know, I, 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 it's a very good point, Dean, and you brought us back on track to where we should have been in the first place. Um, yeah, I, I can see, I can see that absolutely happening. Um, you know, because that's what it's all about. You move as one great big factory, whereas teams might move independently. Um, but as a as a factory, you will ask the, the the independent team to try stuff out. You'll move stuff that they've tried out across to you to the main factory team. So that that's a that's a good answer. It is a bit of a complicated one. Uh, you know, Dean's right with the, all these frames and things. And as you mentioned, Keith, this, these rumours of the Calix frame, which we might see at the Monday test uh, after the, after Jerez. So, so it seems at the moment that that Joan Mia and Mark Marquez have different uh, chassis. They they prefer different chassis. Mark then got injured, and, and those chassis are, are let's say a step ahead, newer. Let's say maybe not better, but newer than what the LCR guys had. Then Mark gets injured, so HRC say, oh. To, to Alex Rins, well, do you want to try Mark's chassis? So then in Argentina, he tries Mark's chassis, felt it was a bit better, wanted to try to try Joan Mia's as well, just to see how that compared. And they were kind of like, um, sorry, we don't have any of those for you. I think in Cota, he actually preferred then his original chassis. So he went back to the original one, I think. So it all gets very sort of complicated and confusing. And it's all about rider feel. But you do have to wonder, you know, has Alex Rins, again, one, one was it one swift, does it make a summer or whatever you're saying was there, Keith? You know, ha but has Rins found a new way to, to ride the Honda in certain circumstances to get the speed from the Honda? You know, we were hearing how he's carrying the corner speed. And I mean, could this work somewhere else? Uh, you know, is it something that maybe Mark will be, you know, hang on, I, maybe I need to try this a little bit. Interesting, you know, because he, he showed in that exact, that one circumstance, it was fantastic, wasn't it? Can they now replicate it? Who knows? And and as far as chassis, yeah, there's loads of stuff coming up. And, and the tests on Monday, is the, that would be one of the big questions. Will we see the Calex? frame as well as the swing arm as Keith mentioned they've used the swing arm for a while now but the, the rumour is <laughs> they won't confirm it but the rumour is that they've got a full chassis that uh, that is being developed so will it make the difference let's see well the good thing about testing at Jerez the day after of course is that track stays consistent I think the weather is going to be fairly consistent as well over the weekend they come off of a racetrack they've just raced on so they've got all that base data but going back to the chassis situation mate I would have two bikes side by side exactly the same exactly the same motors exactly the same chassis and I would want that engine in that chassis and that chassis under that engine. And it would be as subtle as that. You know, you would ride two bikes exactly the same, out the box, settings, everything the same. And yet one chassis would feel better than the other one. Do we call it a chassis or do we call it a frame? I get I get a bit of a rollicking for calling it a chassis now then. Hodgson's always on the me about that. <laughs> you get one frame, they're exactly the same. And yet the feel, as you mentioned, Pete, the all important feel is different. And it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. Particularly if your head's, you know, slightly scrambled anyway, you know, I just, Joe, you know, I sit back sometimes and I look at the screen watching the telly here and I'm thinking the pressure some of these guys are under at the moment is immense. It is enormous. You know, we kind of don't see it because you don't see it. You know, you get a television shot, come back to them all on the wall, waving their hands and giving it all the big old business, but you don't see the, the head in the hands in the back of the garage when the doors are down late at night trying to work out where they're going from here. I mean, he's had en enormous pressure at the moment for all of those guys behind the garage doors. Makes you feel for them. Mm. Well, I do anyway. No, absolutely. Well, thank you, Dean, for getting us back on track. But also just on, um, you know, changing bits and bobs around, trying different things, bringing new innovations. Adrian uh, has sent in a, a great question about um, MotoGP pushing the design boundaries at the moment. Hello, Harry, Pete and Keith. Been loving the podcast since heavily getting into the MotoGP scene. As a fellow rider who loves the sport, though also as a young mechanical engineer who loves to see the boundaries of what's possible being pushed from that perspective, do you see there coming a point where the non-technical fan base opinions around the bikes starts actually limiting the design possibilities for manufacturers and teams? I say this after the large uproar from the recent rear aero devices that everyone seemed to hate on, when in reality, if it makes a millisecond of a difference, to me, that's a great innovation. Can you hear your thoughts? Thank you. Do you know what? Two bloody good questions. That is a brilliant... I mean, yeah, you're right, because it's a prototype series. So to see 
innovation moving forward from an engineering perspective, all of us want to see. But it's a question of how far does that go? What relevance does it have? It's a real tightrope to walk. And as a, as a young engineer, you know, the excitement of doing what you do is to move things forward that millisecond. And that's absolutely correct and right. And that's what you should be doing, you know, within the rules of what they are. I think that the, the key here is to have a set of rules that you can find these innovations within. Otherwise, cost-wise, it goes out of control. This is not F1. There's my first F1 relevance. You know, it's not F1. There's not, you know, trees to pick the cash off. It's a case of it has to be within financial constraints. And how do you financially constrain it is by not allowing too much innovation too quick. Go back to the old days, you know, six-cylinder 125s with, you know, God knows how many gearbox ratios and all the rest of it. It couldn't, it's not sustainable um, in today's marketplace. You know, we've got a Moto3, Moto2, MotoGP series that's very competitive and looking pretty good within the rules that we are. It's a really, I, I, that type rope is, is the only way I can explain it because from an engineering point of view, of course, and an electronics point of view and an aero point of view, all of these things are important innovations for the future. Um, some are more relevant than others. But of course, what happens is who's, who's to say that aero doesn't lead us somewhere else a bit later on down the road to, to, as, as an innovation? You know, that's the great thing about progress, isn't it? I mean, there's stuff on motorbikes now that back in my day, I would never have dreamed that they could have come up with. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> and do you know what I love about engineering is once somebody's done it, it seems bloody obvious. And you're all thinking, why didn't I think of that? It's, it's, it's that crazy scenario that a young engineer, you know, I, I really, you know, hats off to, to youngsters that are moving in that in that stratosphere, because I, I think that, that it's a fantastic job and it's moving everything on. Everything is being developed in our world all of the time. Sadly, quite a lot of it's being spent on missiles and stuff like that at the moment. The wrong that's sort killed, of that's killed the vibe. <laughs> <laughs> that's killed the vibe. Pete, dig us out. <laughs> well, it was interesting. You mentioned there, Keith, when you said when you said young engineers, and everything else, and it just reminded me. So, I was a young engineer from a long time ago. But another story, a quite interesting one, that, that when when Formula One teams hired you know new 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 engineers, new recruits in from the bottom, they would always listen to their ideas because they were looking at the rules with a fresh set of eyes. So it didn't matter that these guys had no experience, you know, they, that they weren't, you know, they had not have a track record of building world championship winning bikes. Those guys would quite often come up with, and as you say, Keith, it sounds obvious once you've, once you've heard about it, doesn't it? But they would quite often go, well, why don't we do something with that? Or the rules don't say something about this. And it's that, of course, you know, and, and it, it, once you hear it or once you see it, it, it makes sense. But what? One of my well, favorites, you're bang on dead right. I mean, Adrian Newey, a legend, an absolute god. When you see him wandering around the back of a car looking at it like this, <laughs> you know that whatever they've done on the car he's spying on is bringing forward new configurations and the like of it. And, and I think that that's, that's what we see to some extent in MotoGP. Although I do feel at the moment that we're a bit... We're a bit... I feel like we've kind of gone through a clumsy period lately. We're, we're hearing about not being able to manage tyre pressures properly and stuff like that. I feel like yeah, we've we've got some things that are absolutely cutting edge, and yet we've got some things that seem a bit clumsy. Um, you know, can't manage tire pressures. You know, within the, within the rules, everybody's up in arms about things like that, and it seems too simple to not be able to manage. And I'm not particularly clever, as you will have heard and will have noticed. Um, so I leave it to other much cleverer people than me. I think one of the worst things that you you would get back to the Adrian Newey um, comparison is that when you don't see things on other people's bikes. I mean, Yamaha had the scoop, the spoon underneath by the back wheel that was there basically quite cleverly to deflect water away from as it came down to the front of the bike, it deflected it away from the rear tire. And of course, Gigi and his crew spotted that as all, that could be a tire cooler or, <laughs> which is what it wasn't allowed to be at the time, an aero device. They got away with it being a tire cooler before it all went bonkers. But, but I mean, spotting what other people are doing um, is is really really important modifying it, and then as an engineer coming up with a new idea within the rules sounds dead easy, but it really isn't. Mm. I think I think if I was going to sum it up, I'd say look, I don't like to see things banned, but I do appreciate that things need to be controlled, 
And I think that's that's how I would prefer to. I don't like it when they, I, we don't want that technology. We just don't want that at all. We're going to ban it completely. I'd rather see, a bit like with Aero, that you limit things. So you keep things under control for the reasons, as you, as you say, Keith, for cost as well. You can't, what we don't want is for people to buy a world championship, is it? That the one with the biggest checkbook has the fastest bike, which wins the world championship. We don't want that. So we already gonna, have that. <laughs> well, I mean, look at Aprilia. Look what they're doing. I mean, you know, there, there seems to be, and, and Suzuki, they, they were seen as having one of the smallest budgets. So it, the point is it can be done. Yep, money will always be, may, be a factor, won't it? And it will always make a difference. But if the rules are written in the right way, you can limit it, I think. Let me ask and you this. That's the balance. Let me ask you both this then. I mean, the problem perhaps with the rules right now is, is the manufacturers all have to agree them. They make the rules. We've talked about this before. The Manufacturers Association sit down and they decide what the rules should be, and then everybody else has to manage those rules and, and enforce those rules. Should there not be an element with it, if we've got to agree unanimously, which I think they do have to agree unanimously with any rule change, um, should there not be a, a, an advocate of some kind of, you know, a, a, from Erta or from from you know the the Danny Aldridge of this world that 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 are able to blackball those ideas and stop something from running away into the distance or better still um, bringing a rule in that benefits the series rather than just the manufacturers tough isn't it yeah safety they can can't they uh, that's the one thing where they can say look we've we've swiped a safety issue here you have to fix this now they can do it then but if it's not safety as you say if it's something to, for more to do with the show it's very difficult the whole unanimous thing i'm not sure how unanimous that sometimes is we don't get to see, you know, you just get told it's un unanimous as in the final. Take the front ride height device. I mean, uh, the understanding is that it was the other the other manufacturers against Ducati, but, it, but it's presented as unanimous because they realized that they're not going to win that vote. So then it goes through as unanimous. But in reality, they were not going to, you know, they, they felt that was the wrong decision and, and it wasn't fair on them. But it is the rulemaking thing. And this is this is this is good timing this whole discussion because of course we've got the next set of rules coming up 2027 where any big changes will be made and those those rules need to be decided pretty much now this year so all of this is going on now how do you look into the future and and bet on what the sport needs in in four or five years time and what the manufacturers need you've got to do it someone's got to do it and uh not easy well, though I I think that's that. I mean, from from an engineering point of view, I mean, we've we've got to go sustainable fuel. Um, we've we've got to be seen to be doing something. I mean, I'm I'm so happy that we're not going down the electric route at the moment, um, just because, I, as you might have guessed from some of the comments I made in the past, I'm not a great believer in battery life and uh, oh, and battery. Our Moto E podcast is still one of the highest rated podcasts we've ever done. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's that's fine. That's because there's so much interest in it, and I understand why. It, environmentally people want it to be right i just don't believe that environmentally that the the, the, the the big digging a hole somewhere in africa to find the minerals to make a battery and then shipping it halfway around the world to to install it in something else and then digging another hole to dump the old bits in because the battery's flat now and we can't use the minerals that are in it anymore it just doesn't seem to work for me quite as well as a sustainable fuel situation that yeah there there must be alternatives and i'm really pleased that motor gp are heading that way i mean I hate. I I watched the Formula E. I like, I really enjoy Formula E. <laughs> Honestly, I have to turn. I mean, I have to turn the sound off. I cannot stand it whining like you know. <clears throat> I I understand. Yeah, racing. Okay, racing is racing, and it's 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 good enough from that point of view. Except it's on all these Mickey Mouse tracks that are made of concrete and they bump about and they all fall over each other like great big lumbering things. Just like touring cars. <laughs> well, yeah, there is a touring cars, but that's that's a, a slightly more um. Um, how do we put that? Let's, uh, it's it's well, let's historic, it. perhaps. Let's not put it. Let's <laughs> let's, let's stick with the bias. But the point being is that I'm pleased, and I and, and I think that it's the right thing to do, and and hopefully going down the sustainable fuel um, direction. I hope that the the rules that we come up with in this next round of configuration that we're going to have from 2024 onwards, and I hope they give themselves a headroom to change those rules as well as the year goes on, uh, subtly. I think that that we are so constrained with changes that you can make, you know, from after testing and so on and so forth. We need to have more room for testing in 2024, so these rules can settle down properly, so that the innovation can settle down slightly better. I mean, getting back to that youngster who came onto us a minute ago, the Aussie kid, 
I mean, at the end of the day, you know, to make that work, you just, you need engineers to be able to have the slightly less in the way of constraint with the new rules to be able to develop those ideas during the first year of those ideas as, as, as they are developing, in my view. Yeah, um, it's a great question from from Adrian. Thank you. I, I'm I'm all for the show, you know, improving that, making it making it better, no matter what the the sport is or the motorsport. But I suppose the other thing is coming back to it, you know, pinnacle of motorsports, you should reward innovation and and progress, right? So, you know, if one team manufacturer brings something and innovates something that is better than the others and starts to to run away with with it then you know in a way you've kind of got to say well fair play it's now up to the others to try and catch up but then there comes when does the limit come where you're like oh come on now you know how long does this dominance last it's boring now it's trying well, to find that fine line right yeah but that's why we had concessions you know they can modify well, now the no one's got concessions right Pardon me? Well, well they pretty don't have concessions anymore, do they? No, they don't. Exactly right. But as, if somebody falls behind, the concessions can come back in. Okay. So it's a situation where I, I think they should make sure that, that that is a distinct possibility so that we don't have you know, people that have fallen behind by innovation that hasn't perhaps quite worked, but with a little bit of, like I say, a little bit of headroom regarding yeah. concessions, then maybe they can they can develop in a slightly different direction. Otherwise, we all end up with exactly the same same thing. But- you know, the, the, the problem with... The problem with a rule book is that sometimes if there is only one mathematical engineering and otherwise way of going about a job, so you all end up going down the same road. And, and that then becomes slightly negative, in my view, because you lose personality in, in the machinery. Um, and, and that's important, particularly in motorbike racing, I think. Mm. You know, it's, it's a, I can't tell you, when I watch a Formula One race or anything like that, you know, motor, Formula E, you know, I, I, I don't understand it. I don't get what the differences are with, with any of it. It seems that it is so constrained that they are all really basically the same. The only thing that seems to make any difference in any of that is the, the, the construction of aero. It's how it's how that package is put together to nip through the air in the way that it should do with that level of horsepower and that level of, of, of power. Um, now, that's talking as, you know, I'm probably talking out of my hat, but you know, a lot of engineers are probably going, no, that's not true. Um, but that's how it appears to me watching in as a casual observer. You know, I, I kind of, it's almost like a one make series um, because it's so complex. I don't understand what is making the difference. You know, why, why of, of, of Red Bull, you know, when they open their bloody DRS thing at the back of the car, why, why is that so much more efficient in a straight line than, than Mercedes, for instance? You know, clearly you can see that they have a definite advantage over it. And it's there for all to see, but no one, no one cleverer than me can work it out. It's it just seems well. Actually, Keith, it's design. all to do with the ground effect and the fact that Mercedes don't have any side pods, isn't they? <laughs> <laughs> Shoot it, me now! Yeah. Shoot me now! God, Pete. And here's a bike example there. That, that, so when you think of riders right now that are, that are amazing on the brakes, you think of Top Rack, right? But he's not. He's using steel brakes, isn't he? Well, super bike, and you've got carbon brakes in MotoGP, which are again prototype brakes, and yet. But the perception from the show side, you know, is that it, it's actually more extreme watching Top Rack on a superbike than it is watching. Uh, well, yeah. there's there's no way that Top Rack will have anything like the advantage in the braking area that he appears to have um, if he no, came no, to No, 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 no. I'm talking about how the show differs from the technology side. Let's say, Do you see what I mean? That, that's what I mean. Where where for the fans watching, they might say, oh, "Look at Top Rack on the brakes. Look at that. That's amazing." And and yet the MotoGP guys are braking much later, much harder. And yet, visually from the show side, it's but I oh know top rack's better on the break. Yeah, I, I'm I'm just giving well, that, that that balance of how the the show versus mm, the mm. technology. Well, you go you go back to Harry's throwaway a bit earlier on. You know, British touring cars is 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 it more entertaining than Formula One? Huh. Some would argue yes. If you go back the the years of banging and barging and moving around, but for me, banging and barging isn't racing. Um, so it's a, a slightly slightly different way of um, looking at it. I suppose. Look, this is an argument. Yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day, the fans are the ones that dictate, you know, what goes on. In as much as, you know, if they switch off because it's boring, then we all lose. At the, so end, of, that- at the end of the day, I think people would rather see. Um- uh, mixed up podiums and grids rather than uh, uh, it, it, rather than sort of processional racing, even if that processional yeah. racing, you could identify the different bikes or the different aero dynamics between them. I think people, if they're given the choice, and please let me know if I'm wrong, I don't want to speak on behalf of it, in my opinion, I would always rather watch close racing than um, looking at the different bits of design and aero that's been brought in i know one might have an impact on the other but let's look at MotoGP because we all thought crap 
Ducati procession. They're going to dominate. Have we been able to predict any of the podiums right this year? <laughs> well, maybe me, but with that exception, <laughs> y- you can't. You know, we all thought KTM you, you would be a disaster. Sorry. So you say yeah. that again? You should make the rules. I should make the rules. <laughs> Being Danny Aldridge. Uh, <laughs> Amateur luck. I would put it down. <laughs> Amateur luck. Right, go on. I wanna, let's, move, let's, let's know what you think about this in the comments. Fascinating debate that I think might have to be a, a degree to disagree or, or disagree to the end of the time. You bring up Top Rack. Pete, and we've had some excellent questions come in so far, and we're going to continue with another one. Um, Nick from Australia. A lot of Australians in today. Um, very welcome. Got nothing else to do. Nothing. <laughs> very welcome. Uh, Nick from Australia. Uh, my question is uh, about... We're top rack. So with top rack's chances of entering MotoGP with Yamaha maybe being hurt because of not being able to get up to speed during his test, Yamaha might look to someone who knows how to ride a MotoGP bike fast already. If Remy Gardner has some decent performances in World Superbikes, uh, would Yamaha maybe look at him? He didn't get to show his full potential at KTM, but I was still able to be fast on a MotoGP bike. And I suppose this then encompasses the wider topic that's come in uh, about top rack probably out. Yamaha be uh, Yamaha given uh, Morbidelli a deadline on on their decision first half of the year. Who wants to take it's that? It's another one? good question in there. Mm. I can see the Remy Gardner, the guns loaded for for Remy, but I, I think let's stick with Yamaha for the moment in the Top Rack deal. Deal. I I was always a bit cynical over what was going on with Top Rack and Yamaha in MotoGP anyway, because I know Keenan Safari Blue isn't a fan. You know, I don't think he's that keen to move Top Rack across. And he knows more than we do regarding the personality of Top Rack. Let's go to the old Top Rack didn't perform perhaps quite as sharp as I might have expected him to do in the in the test. I mean, some raved about him, but but I, I don't think it was a, a great test for him. I think it was significant, as we've already said, that Lynn Jarvis was there, but that was mainly from a management point of view. You can imagine him banging heads with Keenan Software. I can't think of two different personalities that would uh, be in the same cage. Um so that was quite an interesting development there as well. But I think what's come out after that, and particularly around the Aston World Superbikes that we've just had this last weekend, you know, it seems like that door has slammed shut to some extent. It seems like um, Keenan and Top Rack have pretty much decided that uh, World Superbike seems to be the way to, to go for them moving forward. He can have many years in, in there and he can enjoy himself. I think the, the point was, was that MotoGP, he wouldn't last quite so long in MotoGP, wouldn't enjoy it quite as much. And I think that that is absolutely true. It's that it's not just a pinnacle of, of, of perfect motorbikes, but it's also a, a cauldron of intensity that that won't suit many riders. Now, will that suit Remy on his way back? Would Remy want to come back? You know, maybe he'll look to have a long career in world superbikes, which he'll enjoy from a social point of view as well as a, 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 a financial point of view. Um, and maybe he'll want to stay there. I mean, Alvaro, Alvaro Bautista at the moment, you know, everyone's slamming him because his Ducati's quick. Yeah, it is, but he's the man that's making it perform. You know, he is absolutely riding the thing. You know, there, he was a good MotoGP rider. He's coming to World Superbike. Alvaro can go round and round in circles in World Superbike for as long as he likes at the moment with these kind of performances. Um, I, I, I think that there's going to be a high turnover in MotoGP. We've got so much talent coming through that Monlao series from rookies from the you know Spanish championship the C, uh, CEV and the like the junior world championships you ain't going to be in MotoGP for long if you don't perform there isn't going to be that option anymore I, I think the Morbidelli is they've given him full respect I mean you mentioned him a moment ago they've given him full respect he hurt himself they've given him the opportunity to come back if he doesn't perform this year I think I mean Lynn Jarvis isn't known for putting a statement out there that's too cutting edge that's for sure he usually you know keeps his head fairly well below the turret. But I think what you said here is is that basically you perform or you're out, if my reading of it is um, not too harsh. Uh, and also, if you perform, you're in, if you like. I think it was, both, it was both sides, yes. I mean, it was it was you'll get an automatic renewal if you carry on like you did in Argentina. So putting it very much into into Morbidelli's hands and uh, difficult one, isn't it? Because of the, 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 the timing of the contracts, a lot of the rivals are on two-year deals that don't, finish until the end of next year Morbidelli's out of sync because of the whole Maverick Vinal is leaving midway through the year and then Yamaha having to sort of grab Morbidelli move him up and fill the gap and everything else so that's what's put them in this situation where they're they're out of sync with all the other top riders so they're going to have a, a smaller pool of, of choice anyway aren't they um, and as you say Keith they would have hoped I suppose that that Toprak would have loved the bike would have got on this test loved it yeah I want to go 
shown that he had the speed, and then that would have been an easy decision almost, wouldn't it? Or it would have been an easy backup decision if Morbidelli doesn't perform. We've got Toprak here who's ready to go and is already on the pace. But it hasn't worked out that way. As you say, Keith, I agree with what you said about the test. It didn't seem to go the way that, that either side wanted as far as being ready for MotoGP. And uh, with no further tests, it sounds like planned. You, you've got to assume, well, that's that really. And that and that he's at the top rack's attention and, and Keenan's as well. He's, he's focused elsewhere, that being World Superbike, as you say. That that seems to be my, my feeling as well. So, yeah, and, and then if you're Yamaha, well, it's okay if Morbidelli does perform. But what if he doesn't? Who do you get then? You've got top rack. As the question asks, the top rack, who maybe he's not interested because he's not going to enjoy himself as much. If Morbidelli's still struggling, they're, they're going to look for someone new. Who then? You know, Jorge Martin, we've heard before. We've heard rumours about Alonso Lopez in Moto2. But, you know, again, it's a big gamble to put in a factory team, isn't it? Someone like that. That's the trouble here is that Yamaha, you're talking about a factory team seat. And and traditionally, teams don't like to gamble, do they, on, the, on those guys in the factory team? They like to get someone who's going to get in there and be proven that can deliver straight away. And there's not many options for that. And for Remy, uh, just finally on him, I remember asking him last year, you know, what, what's your plan? Is your plan to sort of come back to MotoGP in the future? And to be honest, he said what he said, which was pretty much, I just want to enjoy myself. That's the first thing. I'm not thinking about a long-term, you know, what will I do in five years' time? I want to go to World Superbike and enjoy myself again because he really didn't enjoy himself in MotoGP last year. And that's got to play on his mind. If he's, if he, Even if he's offered the right, he'd want to be sure, I think, that he would enjoy himself on that bike and so you're looking again he'd want to do a test wouldn't he he'd want to do a test like top rack did can i be fast on this bike what do i feel like on it and all those kind of things so i think if it was going to happen there'd be a lot of run up to it we, we'd get a lot of warning because we'd see remy test the bike and all those kind of things i don't think it'll just be a sudden remy Gardner's going to jump into the mrt like that We've got a problem that's going to build this year anyway the attrition rate in 42 races during the course of the year plus all the other bits and pieces that go with it are we're definitely going to get into a situation where, you know, rider, we're riders down um, during the course of the year. There will be more injury. There will be more you know, absentees. You know, this weekend, we're waiting for Bastianini. Is he going to come back? Okay, he's had 10 laps in Mizano on a road bike over the uh, on the Monday. Um, is he going to be fit? Well, I'll tell you what, Arez is a tough little track, and it's going to be warm down there. They've had In Spain, they've had something like 40 degrees in some parts of Spain. It's scheduled to be 30 degrees or above air temperature so that will bring the tyre temperatures right up the track will be scorching it's not an easy racetrack lovely racetrack brilliant racetrack but again not easy so you know attrition wise comes back to what I said before we're going to need subs during the course of the year in MotoGP I've got a feeling that they're, they're going to have to build a you know substitute basis somewhere for some of these factory guys because we're going to be missing top riders only 22 bikes on the grid unless we've got a wild card out there occasionally that ain't enough when you watch some of the races, you know, you, you, I don't know whether you've watched much what's been going on, well, Super Sport 300 or whatever it is at, at, um, in World Superbike uh, category, the, the uh, secondary classes that they've got there. Sorry for calling them secondary. I couldn't think of a better word. Support. But they're like mad. You know, we've got a grid full of bikes. It's like the, it was like the olden days. You just look down the field and they go forever from the start line. You know, 22 quality bikes on the grid for MotoGP you know, it doesn't want to get any less than that. I think that missing, bikes missing on the grid, when we get down to 20 or below, you know, really the sport then is beginning to look a bit, a bit bare, a bit barren. Um, so we need more factory bikes on the grid and there ain't enough factory riders at the moment to cover what we've got if they're injured. So it's going to be very interesting to see where they go. I mean, Jonas Folger, you know, he rode a motorbike very well, but he was like, way off the pace last time out of Kota. Um, and that's what it's going to be like. You know, you cannot get someone to ride, you know, they're all factory bikes on a MotoGP grid anyway, of varying denominator, varying type from whatever year it might be that they, they were manufactured. But they're all very, very trick motorbikes and they're all very, very close in performance, potentially. Um, so to bring someone into that cauldron of red hot pace is going to be really difficult at the moment. They're going to train and they're going to need to have the top racks of this world, backed up, ready to have a go. And then it comes down to testing. You know, they've got to be able to test. You know, so your costs go up all the time. Yeah, We're in a difficult period at the moment. I mean, I, I like the sprint race, but it's added a level of pressure financially and uh, physically from a, from a technician point of view, from a logistical point of view, from a, a manufacturing point of view. I wonder whether anybody really considered seriously enough. 
Yeah, you think they went full beans with it and they didn't do what the F1 guys did and introduce them gradually. They went right every single race and that's a lot of pressure. And and this second half of the season, the people that I've spoken to, even right up to team bosses have said, wait for the second half of the season. This first half, it, the calendar's actually not too bad, is it? There's some decent breaks. There's one after Le Mans, I think, for a couple of weekends. But the second half of the season is relentless. So you, when mm. you combine that schedule with this intensity... Yeah, that's that's uh, it's going to be a tough one. Well, even in broadcast terms, you know, like there's there's quite a lot of. Yeah. It's funny enough. I, I again, I, I'm sorry for viewers from around the world, listeners from around the world. I talk about the British perspective, but a little bit too much sometimes. Don't slam me for it, but it's obviously one that I've got a bit of a handle on. Um, you know, again, this weekend, I mean, BT dropped the ball in the first round, trying to mess around with red button and trying to hide the Mo three of Moa two behind there, picking up world feed commentary and da 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 da. If you're paying a subscription to BT, you would want the people you're paying the subscription for. You want to hear or see what, what you're paying the extra for. Um, and they didn't get it in the first round, and the balloon went up over here in, in the UK. Um, they modified that over the couple of rounds that followed, and it's being modified again this weekend. I have been told that Susie Perry and Sylvain Gintoli are doing free practice commentary on Friday. No. There's one for you. Wow. <laughs> now, I, 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 this is a rumor at the moment, but it's, it's one that I, you know, I, I, I think is um, fairly solid, so we'll wait and see. Um, Gavin Emmett is worn out being stuck in the green cabin in the middle of the car park in the middle of nowhere. It didn't do his ego any good because he couldn't get out and go and hobnob with people and, and uh, go and do the odd feature here and there. So he's being moved out of the commentary box a bit more to come and do one or two other things. So I think BT here. The schedule, especially on the Saturday, is absolutely relentlessly intense for a broadcast team. It's really hard to do. Their budgets, they haven't been given more money to achieve the same thing. And so, therefore, it's become more difficult for them. You know, teams like BT have become, shall we say, presenter heavy rather than, as they were before, commentator heavy. You know, they used to be, they'd be able to swap commentators about in the past if they needed to. Um, whereas now we've got a lot of presenters and not so many, you know, top line commentators. So to move Gavin out of uh, out of a commentary box to do a feature or two because, you know, he's, he, they want to save his voice, I think will be the excuse for it. But at the end of the day, you know, I always predicted that he'd be cheesed off sitting in that commentary box a million miles from anywhere and not being able to do anything else because it's hard work being a commentator through the entire weekend, particularly now on a Saturday. So... And we're seeing this through broadcast teams around the world. Broadcast teams are changing from around the world. It, it will be a budgetary thing as much as anything as well. We'll get into 2024. Believe me, 2024, you will have 50% of the teams that are traveling at the moment to the track to bring you your television or your commentary or your journalism. 50% of them won't be there 50% of the time because it is going to change. The budgets, and there's the environmental thing. You know, when you've got a team of 26 people, as was with BT, traveling around the world in in jets um everybody now as a corporation has a responsibility to the environment um i've talked about it before you'll see the albert the Sus albert sustainable broadcast in the corner i'm working for um bbc northern ireland uh, in may for the northwest 200 and they are trying to achieve the albert sustainability badge if you like because it's BBC, because everybody's got to try and do... It's not just about, you know, the diversity of staff and, and so on and so forth. It's about the environment as well. So they have got to try and bring this down. So the way we travel, how many hire cars we have, how many plastic bottles of drink there are on site, all the rest of it is now audited. So these audits are done in a way that proves that you are sustaining to the best of your ability that production. Now, across the board, that's a good idea. <laughs> but the only problem is, of course, it's bloody motorsport. We're churning out all sorts of junk. <laughs> anyway, um, so it feels like it's sort of a, a, a an exercise rather than a, than a reality. But you can't blame corporates for trying to do that. That will have a limiting effect on who travels to Grand Prix, to World Superbike. All of these big corporations are looking at this and they will be slimming it down. So a lot of things are changing off track as much as they are on track. We talk about the development of motorbikes on track and how we're going about with rules. But the same thing is happening through through all the other worlds that are collide when we get to a Grand Prix. Um, 
there are going to be a huge amount of changes come 24 onwards. Yeah, it's, it's the same in, in Formula One. You know, I've been I've been blessed to do a few Formula One commentaries and, and Formula Three, and uh, I've only been to one racetrack over the last two years, and that was still yeah, and that was they Silverstone. Have to take you to excess baggage. Yeah. <laughs> You're no, too tall. If I try, no, if I travel, it's first class or not, or I'm not doing it. That's why. Uh, so. <laughs> I thought you flew your own plane. Yeah. That was that was Plan B, but they didn't want that one yeah. either. Um, I, I don't know what it was. Anyway, uh, you mentioned the heat of Jerez, Jerez, Jerez uh, this weekend. I'm going to go with Jerez, and I'm just sticking with it. Um, let's have a look at your insider's guide, shall we, Keith? Talk us through what we can expect for this weekend's Spanish Grand Prix. It's going to be hot. Um, find yourself a decent grandstand. Take a lot of sun cream. Uh, this is the place where I've burnt myself to death in the past because it is, it is one of those places where, I, I, from a privilege point of view, I love being able to go around the, the service roads and harass. I know that everybody is able to do that. Um, the campsites are full. It's raucous. You know, the, the car parks are full of motorbikes. It reminds me of Mallory Park in the early 70s or somewhere where you haven't got a square inch of bloody tarmac left to park your bike on not that it was any tarmac at Mallory Park by the way it was all fields <laughs> but it is one of those ones where you've got to get up early in the morning to get there Andalusia or the area of Andalusia is for, for me I like it down that end of Spain anyway as well um, racetrack wise great racetrack those last three right handers before you get down to the airfield just you know motor three and motor two are just about you know damn near flat motor three probably is but motor two you know, up against the curve. When it all goes wrong through those last three right-handers, it goes wrong spectacularly big. Um, it's a it's a great race that hasn't changed. And somehow, I don't know how they do it. The tarmac always seems to be okay. I mean, it works better if it's cooler there. You you, you used to get the the World Superbikes guys would test there earlier on in the year when it was a little cooler, and they'd get some really fast times out of it. But once the heat comes up, and it's going to be hot, it's going to be low grip, uh, this weekend because of the heat and uh, that when all that crap that's in the tarmac starts to emulsify and, and become squidgy and horrible um, I can see this is where our predictions I mean I'm already thinking in my head <laughs> prediction wise <laughs> low, low low grip in the heat who's that going to be you know like uh, you got your binders and your KTMs that suddenly come into the into the Ooh. equation and I also remember Bangaya going very very well around there one of the first times where he really stood out and then he dumped it, um, which seems to be a, a career um, fault at the yeah. moment. Well, I mean, Pete, this is this is a big weekend for, for a lot of our big hitters, really. Peko being one of them. That's right. Yeah, I mean, he, this was the event last year, wasn't it, where he sort of got everything back on track. It was It was his first win of the year and he, he led it all, didn't he? He led, uh, Quattro was in his wheel tracks the whole time. Then we had the whole tyre pressure thing that came up after the race, wasn't it? Because, of course, Banyaya leading the whole race meant that his tyre pressures remained low. And then, you know, we had this, this sort of unofficial list that came out from Mitchell and everything else. Here we are one year later where potentially they will be starting to enforce penalties from this weekend. We need to see if they decide to do it or whether they still want to keep on gathering information for another round or two. But, Let's hope uh, they've written them right. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got, yeah, you've got that big weekend for Banyard Quattararo as well. Really, he needs to get back on track this weekend. Uh, Banyo had a great record around here and I think you know 45 points he's given away these last two races he needs to put a stop to that doesn't he and uh, let's hope he's got an explanation for what went wrong in, in Kota or the team can at least give him an explanation so that he can feel more confident uh, Mark Marquez coming back again you know he's got to he's got to avoid doesn't he the, the impatience that we saw in Portimao I, I guess there'll be that feeling of trying to make up for lost time and then that's the last thing that, that Mark needs to be feeling isn't it is some sort of you know, he's, he's got to get consistent results and stay out of trouble, isn't he, this weekend, really? And Danny Pedrosa coming back, former teammate of Mark, um, you know, 31-time Grand Prix winner, the most most GP wins without a title, isn't it? And uh, back on, uh, on the KTM, so he's on the on the factory KTM where he's a, a test rider, obviously. I think he was 21. He did the, the last wild card in, in Austria. Did well. He was, I think it was about 10th or something. But there was that big fiery yeah. accident, big scary just thing. Just avoided and, yeah, it, so, didn't he? It wasn't with that incident, was it? So, uh, yeah, but anyway, back at his home track. So this will be a big one. Obviously, last time was it, you know, it was a big event for KTM. But this one, I think, a big event for him personally. Got a corner at the track named after him as well. Mm. So uh, of all the places, I think he'll be looking forward to coming back. And as Keith says, a great event in Jerez. One of those that, one of those that you need to book early because it does sell out. It's, uh, 
you know, it's not easy to find accommodation there. It's not like there's some places, tracks like Barcelona or uh, Kuala Lumpur, you know, Malaysia, things where you could just grab a last minute ticket and head out there and, and not have to worry about finding accommodation. A res isn't like that. It, it's going to be sold out. It's a bit like Assen or uh, Bury Rum, those sort of places where you need to get things planned in advance because, as Keith says, the car parks will be full. And, uh, it's, and it's up close and personal, I think. Every time I go to a res, you, wow, this place looks small. You, you just, you, it just seems so. It's down in the valley, uh, which is great viewing for the fans. The track is quite narrow and twisty, and it always comes as a bit of a shock to me. You think, wow, that's, uh, you know, after seeing the big tracks at the winter testing, for example, the, the, the Sepangs and Qatars normally, very different, very traditional track. And uh, yeah, it, it, usually great atmosphere, great racing, and it sounds like great weather. So uh, a lot to look forward to, I think. Yeah. Bring your sun cream and your sunnies. Uh, and if you haven't got accommodation, well, bring a tent as well. And you, you bring up uh, Danny Pedrosa. It's actually going to be crucial, really, for, for his experience riding in a race because he might well be needed for a few more later on in the year. I think Ravola was saying uh, last week, you know, we might end up with a race where it's just test riders the way we're going at the moment, which is a slight ah, worry. Well, you, you've just come up with the sprint race alternative, haven't you? I would be. Sp- I would be down for that. Yeah, the sprint race alternative. Stick all the second riders in there, you know. And that's out. Um, it's funny that uh, the the amount of again you said it earlier on. It's been a slow news week, really, one thing and another. Not that there isn't any news, but they just haven't confirmed any of it, yeah. which is a real pain. Um, but the uh, I don't know the way that this is going to shape up at uh, during the course of the year regarding test riders. And I mean, off would you want to be Danny Pedrosa slung in the deep end at, at Herrera? You know here. It's a tough call. It really is. I mean, to go from, you know, test riding to a full-on Grand Prix. I mean, he was scheduled for Aragon, which, you know, you might have expected him to go quite well around there as well. Um, I don't know. I mean, I I just think the whole thing... It, I mean, one of the other arguments has been this week about, you know, whether the grid should be set by the mm. sprint race final position and so on. I quite like the BSB way of doing it, whereas your lap times set your grid. So whatever lap time you did in the in the previous race, that set your grid for the for the second race. So if you did one lap and you put it on a qualifying tire, you could be the the, the, <laughs> the the man on pole for the for the next race coming. So there's it just adds another strategic level to the to the whole thing. Um, but I think Simon Crafar was quite uh, aggressive, I think, which is unusual for Simon off track. <clears throat> but uh, he was quite aggressive in that that. You know, if someone T-bones you on the first bend of the first lap in the sprint race, that's ruined your entire weekend because you, you, you'll you be on the back of the grid come the main race the next day. Now, from a spectator point of view, is that a bad thing? <laughs> Maybe <laughs> not. <laughs> but from a racing point of view, from a, from is, a yeah. you know, it really is from a, you know, a team that's worked as hard as they have to get you where they need to get you and then um, you're stuck on the back of the grid just because someone else has had you over um, in the first lap, of, first bend of the first lap of the sprint. <clears throat> so I think if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna nail my um, what's it's to the mast. Yeah, come on then, prediction time. It would well, no. First of all, oh. it would be that I like the fact that um, you qualify for your good oh, right. positions rather than you win them through your sprint race. Mm. That that would still be mine in a premier in a premier class. I I quite like. Uh, I I agree with that. The other thing I would say is that it does make qualifying so important, now, doesn't it? Because it's yeah. for two races. I mean, I think ideally, and I don't know how you do this, you would have a separate qualifying somehow for each race. But but that's just creating more issues, isn't it? But, but I think that is a problem. One bad qualifying session, and you're going to have to pay for it for two races, isn't it? I, I don't know. But it, there's no easy solution, as we've seen. But I think, you know, this is this is the first year, isn't it? I wouldn't be surprised if there are some tweaks, let's say, made oh, God, the yeah. next year to the format. Surely. Surely they'll have to. Um, but either way, I think double the racing, more fun for us to watch. Prediction time. We're out of time, but it's prediction time. So make them quick, please. Um, no dilly-dallying. Sprint race predictions. I'll go first. Save you a bit of time. We've already done mine. I've gone for for the sprint. I'm going for Peko Redemption. Peko uh, Vignaya. Vignales, second. And I'm going uh, for an Aprilia 2-3 with Alicia Spargro on my sprint race podium. Peter, who have you got? Uh, I will go Banyaya, also for Redemption. I think he's usually... Pretty awesome around the res. I think if he doesn't win this weekend, he's in trouble. Uh, Quattro also. It's, it's usually a good track for him, so I'll go for him second. And I will go a pretty. I'll go. I'll go a Leish third. I think uh, Spanish rider at that track. He went well last year. Keith's angry. So <laughs> Keith. 
I will yeah, like well, it. I was going to put the lace in there for sure. <laughs> is this is this just sprint race? This is just here? sprint for the minute. Well, definitely a lace. So I'm going to have a lace. I'll tell you what, then. I'll have him round the other way. I'm going to have a lace for a win. Okay. It's all going to be down to qualifying. If you don't qualify well, then he's screwed. But anyway, at least <laughs> a lace, a lace is, a, is a fighter. So let's have a lace on the on the Aprilia. Quattara, uh, Bangnaia, Quattararo. Okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. All right. Uh, Grand Prix now. Um, I'm going Peco, Marquez. But which uh, one? And which Vinales. One? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep it ambiguous. <laughs> and Vinales on the podium. Pete? Come on, you've got to name your Marquez. No, no, I think we should be allowed, for this weekend, I think we should be allowed a, a general Marquez on the podium. A general Marquez, it's like the Joker card. Yeah. Right, um, I'll, I'll go, I'm going Pekka and Quattara again, okay. and I will go Miller for third. Mm. I, I'm going to steal Keith's idea about the rear tyre grip and there's the heat and a long race, and maybe that'll just help him at the end. Went well, well last year was in that fight, wasn't he, for third? He didn't get third, but it was a late... Miller and uh, Marquez, wasn't it, battling? That was really the most interesting battle of the race. Um, so, yeah, I'll go with Jack to uh, put the KTM third. Okay. Mr. Hewan? Peko Rins Binder. Ooh, okay. I have some of that. Rins, yeah. 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 I mean, there's so many. You could, there's, there's 12 riders, isn't there, probably at least that you could pick for a podium this weekend. I mean, I, I can't be the... bloody following you lot. You have me going third every time. Sorry. Yeah, every, I mean, no, we I mean, don't. No, I never, no, no, I never no, go this first. Time, this time, this time, oh, this this time. time. oh, yeah, sorry. Um, well, just, just to remind, friendly reminder that I am currently two points ahead uh, in the stand. Oh, no, That's I'm not. Friendly, oh, no, I'm two points ahead of You're somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> two points ahead of Pete. <laughs> Pete's last. He's dwindling behind. Um, okay, right. Let us know your predictions as well. We love to see them. Um, but that is it. We're out of time. Thank you very much for sticking with us for uh, this hour show. Make sure you're tuned in across the rest of the week for all the latest news and analysis on crash.net. And we'll be back with you next week to look back at it all, get your questions in, leave them in the comment section, tweet, Instagram, Facebook us. Our email is podcast at crash.net. And you can leave us a review wherever you get your podcast. Just um, search for them on Apple or Spotify. They're the ones to leave a review on. Thank you very much if you do so. Uh, but from me, Harry Benjamin, from Keith Ewan, and from Pete McLaren, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>